Ladies and gents, this is the moment you've been waiting for, a podcast for podcasters. This is Creating the Greatest Show, and I'm your host, Casey Cheshire. Join me as we interview podcast hosts and investigate the ingredients of a successful interview podcast. We'll talk mistakes, earned skills, powerful questions, and more. This show is sponsored by Ringmaster, completely done for you, B2B podcast production. I can't wait to introduce you all to my guest today, a well-known person in the podcasting industry. Uh, he is a social entrepreneur. He's a, he's a coach, a mentor, um, and a fellow podcaster and a trail runner, ultra marathons in his repertoire, host of the Awarepreneurs podcast, founder of Awarepreneurs, but most notably known for consulting and coaching social entrepreneurs. Paul Zelizer, welcome, sir. Thanks so much for having me, Casey, and congratulations on what you built. I know for a fact that growing a podcast is not an easy thing to do, so just thanks for holding down this conversation for as long as you have been. Likewise, it's a great place to start a podcast when the guest and the host are just really glad the other person's there. We're on this show. I can't wait to pick your brain. I have a brand new blank piece of paper over here. I can't wait to fill with your wisdom. So I want to start the show with this question we always start the show with, which is to pull back the curtain for us on your show and share your most important strategy for great interview podcast. It's a wonderful question, Casey. Um, so the simple answer is, find great guests and prepare them for extraordinary dialogues. And we can unpack how I do that, but if you want one line, that's it. Prepare them for extraordinary conversations. Man, okay, I, I, this sounds fantastic. I feel like this is like a two-part recipe for success, you know? Find cookie dough, add to oven, like, <laughs> let's go. And put chocolate chips in it, right? Oh, it comes <laughs> prepackaged, man. I, nothing but the Pillsbury Doughboy for me. Um, so find great guests. Uh, most people might say easier said than done. So what has been your secret recipe for that? Well, I'd say that's an iterative strategy. So we just published episode 285 yesterday, six years running plus. So, you know, it gets easier over time. Podcasting is like compounding interest. And anybody who's like, I'm going to launch a podcast and the money's going to fall out of the sky and I'm going to be rich and famous by episode number five. I don't know who you're talking to, but go away. Just go away. Like, you don't have a freaking clue. Like, you're in the wrong space. But what to understand with podcasting is it's compounding interest, right? Just like really smart investors understand we're not playing, you know, there are a few people, but a very small percentage of investors get wealthy by doing something in a day or a week or even a month. It's a, it's a long play, right? So, but basically a couple of strategies in the find great guests. Number one is I've built really strong relationships with PR and podcast booking agencies, particularly those who have a lot of guests and are known for working with people in the impact space. What do you mean by social entrepreneurship or impact business? What I mean is people who are trying to make the world a better place as they're going about their business activities. It's not just like sell more stuff. Not that I'm against that, but that's not what I'm all about. Um, people know me in that space, right? So the reason that that's really helpful is because they're getting paid and it's not by me, right? It's not by the host. The right. people who pay for professional services, really smart people to dedicate their time and energy to getting really great guests on podcasts like yours, listeners. Yeah, that's what PR really good PR people and podcast booking agency by definition understand the value of a niche audience like a podcast and they're getting paid to do it and the person paying them is a guest. So just by definition, that person is more prepared. They understand the value of being on a show and they're going to bring their A game because they're paying to be there. So that's, that's one right. example. There's many other things I could share about how to do that. PR professionals. It sounds like you've met good ones because sometimes in my mind, when I think about PR folks, I think about people who are kind of behind the times. They're not keeping up. They're still trying to get something in the newspaper that, that already shut down. Yeah. Um, and then on the booker side, sometimes you get these crazy bookers that just like, I have a marketing podcast and like, here's somebody that plays with trucks. And you're like, ah, they don't do any <laughs> marketing whatsoever. They just came out with a new violin album. Right. And you're like, I have a marketing right. like, podcast and cool. what? right. 
Right. And that's why I'm saying I build, notice I started this by saying I build relationships. So they're mm. not just random PR or podcast booking folks. So I'll give you an example. It's just happened. I'm in a conversation. I had a guest, a fabulous guest from my show. She just won a Fast Company Award for being number four in the CSR, um, in other words, an important metric in the impact business space. She won number four award, just got announced wow. last week. I like kind of broke the news on my show. Um, it's a program called Keys to the Classroom. The guest was Dana Bryson. And the she had hired a PR firm. That PR firm knew they didn't understand the podcasting space as much as they might want to. So they actually contracted with a friend of mine, a colleague, Julie Fry who has a podcast agency called Your Expert Guest. Julie's awesome. I've known Julie for a couple of years now. She knows what I do. She has a lot of guests who are in the impact space. When they went to her, she said, Paul, this is a great fit for you. Dana's freaking awesome. Dana Bryson, the guest, right? Mm -hmm. And it was an awesome conversation. I got to break the news of a Fast Company Award winner. I don't think any other podcast had had that story out there. It's an incredible story of a business doing positive impact at scale. In this case, recruiting teachers who are really diverse and they have a very innovative way that they do that. And that all came through a relationship of somebody who is in the podcast space, books guests, known me for years. And um, we've had quite a few interactions with just Julie. Plus, she has a whole team of I don't remember how many, but I just book somebody else through your expert guest. That's just one of many, many relationships of the kind of agencies that understand who my audience is and they share the values mm. of the kind of stories that I like to tell. How do you build that list? So a lot of what I do is on LinkedIn. LinkedIn, I find people who on LinkedIn, well, first of all, again, I've been around for a while, so people approach me all the time. I get dozens and dozens of pitches a week. I pay attention to those pitches, who's sending them, and particularly the ones that are either spot on or pretty close. And then I reach out to them and say, hey, look, I love to have relationships. You know, this one is perfect. Thank you. Or this was close, but not quite there. I wonder if we could jump on a call and let me help you understand my audience and the kind of stories that we'd like to tell. So I invest in those relationships because one podcast booking agency or one PR firm that really understands my show will send me guests for years on end. It's a great half an hour right. invested to have a networking conversation. So sometimes it's on LinkedIn and I'm paying attention and I notice that there's a thread and here's somebody who works in a PR firm that seems really interested in the kind of issues that I'm interested in, my listeners are interested in. And or just by like, as the inbound starts to happen, I start noticing where it's coming from. And if I get even one, but especially if I get two or three that are spot on or close, then I'll send an email mm -hmm. and just say, hey, you know, thanks for sending me such a great guest. This was spot on or this was close, but we're not quite there. I wonder if you'd be willing to spend 15 or 20 minutes on a call. Love to tell you who my listeners are. Tell me who your guests are. And let's see how we can get some of your people on podcasts. Even if it's not my show, I know a lot of other hosts, so I might be able to help you get them on other shows just by introducing you to people. And, and not everybody says yes, but the number of people in the industry who will say yes is very high because it's their job to get them on shows yeah. of people who, you know, they get paid literally. So when I say, hey, yeah. bring that person on, that contributes to the deliverables that they're getting paid for. If they, especially on the PR side, they are paying, then they're probably going to be more likely to promote that episode. Not that you're doing it for them to promote it, but it's always nice when your guest doesn't, you know, radio silence. You, but they're, they're happy to vent on it too, you know? Absolutely. From the promotion they do to the equipment they bring, they're more likely to have a podcast mic or something that sounds good. Their presence, they're more likely to have some key points. We're going to talk about that. So... You know, like they're not just there to chat, they're, they're understand the relationality of podcasting, but they're also really committed to bringing value because they're professionals, they're paying to be there. So they're bringing their A game and they're not just like, 
oh, Casey, you're an awesome guy. Let's talk about hiking. But you're here because you want to help your listeners really knock it out of the park with their podcast in terms of their goals, right. in terms of marketing. I understand that. And I'm trying to bring my A game, not just, hey, Casey, you're a nice guy. Let's talk about hiking. And podcasting is kind of awesome, too. All that's true, but how can we be <laughs> relational creatures and really understand the audience and help deliver value to that audience? Somebody who's paying 800 a month, 2000 a month, $5,000 a month to be on shows just like yours is going to be more likely to bring their A-game and really knock it out of the park for your audience. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um but you did get me thinking, like, I want to talk to you about hiking at some point. So uh, you say hiking one more time. We're going to <laughs> oh, go off I'm totally on a tangent. Down for hike. <laughs> <laughs> totally oh, down God, for you hike. said it. All right. No. So um, on the flip side, have you ever had anyone that was too prepared because they came from the PR person yes, and they were totally. so coached and trained? You don't feel like you really yes. even talked to them, maybe. Welcome to my TED Talk, right? Like, yeah, like it's so <laughs> – I don't know if anybody knows, you know, the TED – formula, but there's actually a TED oh, talk yeah. that makes fun of the TED formula. Insert pregnant pause here. Walk closer <laughs> to the audience. Like it's very formulaic if I you're not careful, up. right? I, I, I can't remember who did it. It's a fabulous TED talk that makes fun of the equation of how speakers get coached to do a TED talk. So yes, there, there, there can be some overtraining, but I would say that's the second part prepare them to have an extraordinary dialogue. And I actually will say, hey, this isn't just another stop on your book tour or this isn't a TED Talk. Like my listeners want relationality as well as good information. And that's in the second part of that sentence, prepare them for an extraordinary dialogue. So I will actually interrupt if somebody's just kind of going on there like I'm now in professor talking head mode and I lost the relationality. My audience doesn't like that. Maybe some audiences do. But in general, podcasting research says people want a good combination of relationality, whether that's great storytelling or humor or some like sense of these are human beings talking about issues I care about and being very warm and fully authentic humans and really good information. And, and if somebody's leaning out too hard in the direction in one way than the other, I see it as my job. First of all, I'll try to prevent that through getting them ready through the prep work that we can talk about. But also if they start to head down that, then I'll interrupt. I'll crack a joke. Wait, didn't you say something about Thai food, right? And they were just talking about some like... <laughs> some like metric that they're using to like measure their impact. I'll get back there, but I'll crack a joke or like, you know, just find yeah. a way to bring the relationality back into the conversation. Let's talk about that. Okay. I haven't talked about relationality. First of all, love the word because I think there's a lot to this. How would you define that? Well, let's think a minute. So, so I'm really blessed. I had a fabulous podcast mentor. His name is um, Keith Carlson. And uh, Keith has one of the oldest nursing podcasts on the planet. We think it's number three. It's called the Nurse Keith Podcast. Keith is awesome. Shout out. I literally wouldn't be here without him. Um, he's a career coach for nurses and does a bunch of other things in the medical podcasting space. But Keith is also awesome. a friend and a neighbor. And Keith said, Paul, you need to podcast. At that point, I was a long form blogger. That was my primary marketing strategy. I'd gotten quite good at it and was getting results. And Keith sat me down and said, you need to start a podcast. Like, Keith, you, it took me years to like <laughs> learn how to blog, right? You want, I, I, I don't know, time, like what? But I care about him. And he said, listen, Paul, and I'm going to show you what he showed me. He said, Paul, how do people listen to podcasts? They literally put us inside of their bodies. They literally invite yeah. us into the space between their ears. It's the most intimate form of mass communication the world has ever seen stopped. Stopped me in my tracks, right? I have a master's degree in counseling. My first uh, career was in community mental health. I'm an incredibly relational human. I really care about human relationships. And there's all kinds of research about how that translates. I didn't know it, but like emotional intelligence is more predictive to your success in business than your technical skills. Most people don't want to talk about that, but you can go look at Google's um, Search Inside Yourself program. It's an emotional intelligence-based program. Um, there's a book called Search Inside Yourself. So I'm not just like, it's not my opinion. That's what the research is saying. Anyway, Keith's also an incredibly relational guy. He knows how I'm wired. We're friends. He's probably need to start a podcast. I ah, roll my eyes. What are you, I'm way too busy. He says, <laughs> most relational form 
of mass communication. So you can reach a lot of people, but you can do it in a relational way. And I said, tell me more. And here we are, you know, yeah. it took me a year and a half to actually launch it to kind of make the space. But yeah, seven and a half years later, here we are to have one of the best known social entrepreneur podcasts on the planet. Thank you, Keith. Right. So that's what we mean right. is that it, it it's not just information. It's also information in the context of real people's lives. How are they implementing this? What are the struggles? What are the nuances? What are the intersections? What are the complexities? What are the challenges? Podcasting, for me, does a better job of allowing us to explore those things than other forms of mass media. I've been in business 16 years, and a lot of my work is helping people make marketing choices and decisions and pick platforms and messaging and all that stuff. So, you know, I've thought a lot about all this. And uh, at this point, there's nothing that comes close to podcasting when it comes to those kinds of uh, allowing us to go into that kind of terrain. We, we share that. I, I love the aspect of connecting one-on-one -on -one with people it, oh, almost to the point where I neglect the audience and I've had some great guests <laughs> on the past. They're like, don't oh, forget I see about you, that. So, uh, yeah. Casey, <laughs> makes me, I see you audience. I won't forget about you, <laughs> <laughs> but I get, I can get so focused in, but also I, I want that connection. Right. And, and so I think we were joking earlier where, you know, if people don't want to do our prep call or they don't want, they're not interested in the, in the connection side. They just want to like get their stuff publicized. It, like that just, I'm not, I'm not interested in that. And so half of the relationship side of this relationality, it's like you need both sides for that really, for the podcast yeah. that you and I like, right? Where there's information Absolutely. in context, like you're talking about. Yeah. And that's that getting people ready for an extraordinary dialogue, right? That's part of what I do. And, and Casey, I was, I was hilarious laughing. I was like, um, before we hit record, I, we, you did a meet and greet with me and it was like, your mean greed could have been my mean, like your outline could have been my alley. Nice. You know, the, you asked a slightly different first question, but like, basically it was like so close. I've never in years of podcasting and guesting, I've never seen anybody does a mean greed almost like it was 97% overlap. Right. Wow. Um, so, so when you say we approach it the same way, I'm literally saying we approach it 97.9% .9 like reading off the same script. <laughs> right. We like, are you, are you looking at my Google drive? Like what? <laughs> right. I know. Right. Who are these two bald guys who like to be outdoors and are really passionate about Thai podcasting food, and why hiking. are they reading off of the same outline? I don't know. Right? <laughs> so, um, Go, let's go. Let's go theoretical for a second. Just about this idea, uh, this this relationship. It, it's a two way street. When it when it's done, let's say the way that we like doing it here, this sort of dialogue we're having, it's is it a rubber band? I, I feel like there's this sort of thing where, you know, it, it's this it's this pull, right? pull and push or whatnot. But at some point, yeah. you can break it, and then I've done this accidentally, and I've had guests tell me later they felt it. Right. Where I'm no longer paying attention. Right. Um, mm. Or I am or I'm not. But like or the guest is no longer into it. But like it's almost like there's this sort of almost like a dance. Right. Like a dancing lesson. And then totally it, I'm not making you go anywhere. You're not making me go anywhere. But I could it, we could break it and then you got to kind of get it back. I don't know. Have you have you felt any of that? Yeah, I was I was thinking I'm not very good salsa dancing, but I've taken a little bit of a few lessons. And there's actually this like sense of like you want enough um like tension and 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 sense of presence. I remember the dance instructor saying, so that you can play. Like if you have too much, you're stiff and you're it, you know, it's like all information and you know, hi, welcome to my podcast, right? Hi, I'm right. guesting and let me tell you the seven things you need to know about X part of marketing, right? And that feels <laughs> really stiff. Or it can be so loose right. that it's just kind of like a wet noodle and like wet noodles don't do salsa very well. There's this dynamic moment where there's enough like that you can push and pull off of each other when a couple is really good at salsa. There's enough presence, enough energy, enough push and pull, but not so much that it's rigid or tight or they're in conflict. You got to play with that push and pull. That's that's the image that came to mind when you were talking, Casey. Yeah. It, it almost like, I don't know if they had you do this. I mean, I'm the same way. Like I like salsa music probably, uh, you know, 
because I can listen to it as opposed to necessarily <laughs> you, you, you have the, the the two people and and even they've had this practice where your hands are like touching and then the whoever's leading is moving in one direction and the person following is actually it's interesting because you're moving together and you're not telling each other where you're going but you're you're like sort of giving the feedback loop of like are our hands yeah. this close and then you're sort of going with it absolutely great yeah and and again in a when you're guesting, you want to listen. I, I teach my clients. I, I love podcast guesting as a strategy for growing a business. I know yeah. we're mostly talking about hosting, so we can bracket that. But that's a huge. If you need to move the needle more quickly, you don't have time for that compounding interest. You've got a book you're launching or your new campaign or, you know, whatever. You're launching a new division of the company. Guesting moves the needle more quickly. Long term, there's nothing like being a host. But um, the, for the host to know, I think it's our job. Somebody's got to lead and somebody wants to follow. You right. both can be great. You both want to be great dancers, work on improving your craft, so to speak, of being a salsa dancer. But one person's going to lead. And in the podcasting analogy, let that be the host. And one person's going to follow. Let that be the guest. But know that mm -hmm. you're playing together with an audience who's also if you're doing it well, is going to be both entertained or at least engaged and getting a lot of value out of the conversation. So there's a lot going on. There is, I, I want to get this. Um, we chatted earlier in the, in the prep call about this one thing, and maybe you, you could like restate it. it. It was something about you could have um, two really brilliant people that have a like a shitty relationship. They're like, they're, they're, <laughs> they don't have the relationality and it creates right. for a, terrible podcast you would think oh yeah two great world leaders talk, like no no relationship terrible listen but then the the flip do you remember that but i think you're, i think you're, then the second part was um or you could have two people that aren't the most brilliant or whatnot but they have that relationship in context and so yeah. then it made such a better listening experience for Absolutely. Are the listeners getting a sense that the host and the guest, or maybe there's more than one guest, but who's ever on the show, do they care, right? That's like one of the basic questions. And this is something, again, like I go back to in that meet and greet. I really work with the guest in that meet and greet and help them understand who's listening and what they care about. And as somebody who's guested a lot, and also, you know, we have 285 episodes live as of, you know, yesterday, a lot of wow. guests come on my show and they're like, oh my God, I've done a lot of guesting and nobody's really helped me understand the audience quite like that before. It's not complicated. It takes me about 30 seconds to explain who the audience is, but that disrupts the welcome to my TED Talk, talking to <laughs> head professor kind of energy. And I'll say like, look, our job, I don't, maybe I'll use this going forward. I don't usually use the analogy of a dance, but our job is to have a really engaged conversation that we're both bringing a lot of care and passion to for the benefit of the listener. But if we like or don't give a damn about the topic, why should the listener give a damn about the topic or the podcast, right? It's our job as host yeah. to help bring some of that fire, to help bring some of the why, and then to help the guest kind of, I at least on my podcast, I'll often say, you wouldn't be on the show if I didn't know you were world-class experts. I don't have to interview anybody but somebody who's really doing incredible work. And I know what that looks like. My listeners know what that looks like. But I'll say it's not just that you know your stuff. Please hear me when I say I know you know your stuff. But I want you to listen to who our audience is and kind of join me in making sure. I call it legacy content. Casey, I want people to still be listening to Awarepreneurs. I still refer people to episode number one. I know exactly who it is. It's Vicky Abadesco. She's a friend. She's an incredible social entrepreneur. And anybody who's doing work in schools, she's working with to stop bullying in schools in a very oh, wow. incredible way with so much care and attention and scale. She's working with hundreds of thousands of kids every year. So anybody who's doing stuff in schools, especially violence or bullying in schools, immediately send them to Vicky's episode. The branding on my end sucks, but her and I had an incredible <laughs> conversation. I wish I had invested in better branding, but that's my fault. But the quality of the content six years later, even though there's a lot gone on in the world, it's still a world-class conversation. And that's what I want to wow. aspire to. Do I hit that with every guest? Probably not. But no, I don't. But sure. 
the percentage of times that our listeners say, I listened to an episode from four years ago, and that's still an amazing episode. That's what I'm trying to do. And that's how I explain to my guests why I asked for that 15 or 20 minutes of their time, that relationality, that like rapport, that helping them understand the listeners. Then when we bring their world-class knowledge into a relational context, they feel a little more comfortable because we've told a joke about hiking and eating Thai food or whatever other common threads we might find in that short conversation. It feels different. We have that relational context and they're a world-class human and they understand who they're talking to. And I ask them to have three to five, maybe even a couple more points of value. You put that all together and it doesn't sound like a lot, but what people tell me, both the guests and the listeners is, they don't often have that experience as listeners. Right. Wow. It, I do hear glimmers of my own prep. Oh, it's like, it's ridiculous how much overlap there is. <laughs> how do you, uh, what do you, when you convey the audience, what, how do you like to convey that? Well, first of all, let me just say, listener, like, like I'm really, Casey and I didn't know each other. <laughs> I'm doing more of a podcast tour to help just kind of find out who's more out there. I've been kind of blinders on. So anyway, I just want to say, Casey, like you're, I, again, as a guest, I have been through a lot of guesting onboarding and, and I think you do a fabulous, like, like really, really set that relational tone and, and what you did to help me understand your listeners again, it just cracks me up. We have different audiences, but how right. do you talk about it? Very, very familiar. So if anybody's wondering whether Casey knows this stuff, at least <laughs> My opinion is, is yes, listen here, you're getting great advice. Um, really what I say, Casey, is, you know, Wordpreneurs is all about social entrepreneurship and, and people who are on the, you know, if it's a continuum, people who are like kind of curious about it, maybe I've heard about it, I want to find out, and people who are like dedicated, like this is my life, at least my professional life is 100%, I'm all in both feet, I'm on that end of the continuum like really wanting to have positive impact at the biggest degree of scale in the hardest, most complicated problems that humans are facing. Um, Those are my listeners. Different impact areas, some are in climate, some are working with marginalized communities and working on economic development, some are about gender equity, um, sustainable ag, like, like there are many different impact areas. I'm a bit agnostic about which area, but the commonality is they're really far on the end of like, how far can we push the needle into positive impact and how do we make a living while doing it? So we care about business and things like revenue, but we're not doing business to get another, you know, to get our fifth house or to get a private jet plane. We want to live well, we want to have, you know, be able to send our kids to a good education. We want to eat quality food. Um, but it's not about more money for more money's sake. It's about how do we get enough, pay our people well. And the big um, focus of our listeners is the world is dealing with pretty big challenges. <laughs> how do we leverage yeah. this huge engine on planet Earth called business to help make the world a better place? And then within that, I talk about two buckets, about half of our listeners, and I know this through some formal like surveys, but more just informally who emails in when somebody says, hey, that was a great episode on social media. I go try to find out what I can about them on LinkedIn or go look at their website. Like who's, who's commenting, who's engaging, who's emailing me. So, you know, just trying to get a sense that way um, more than f- uh, or as much as any formal surveys, but basically it's two buckets, the more established social entrepreneurs and the way I describe that they have product market fit. they have pretty strong revenue and they're listening for things like how to, in, you know, scale better how, thinking like team development. Um, and also like what's trends in the space of social entrepreneurship. Like we used to have lots of journals, printed journals, and those are fewer and far between these days. But a lot of people who are experienced listen to awarepreneurs and other podcasts, just what's trends in the space, who are up and coming players, et cetera, et cetera. And then the other 50% are up and comers, 
they have an idea, they want to make an impact in a certain impact area, but they don't necessarily have great product market fit, the revenue isn't that strong, and they're listening for things like, how do you go from a concept that maybe has a little bit of momentum to making this a real full-time business and uh, go from like two or three people to the first couple dozen, right? That, that's, that's their big goal. So those are my two buckets and exactly what I just said from that like continuum to the buckets within it, that's exactly how I describe it. I can totally see how that helps break up the scripted TED Talk, right? Because now I'm thinking, well, I have a talk all about why podcasting is great for brands, but that's not how I'm talking to. I'm talking to the social entrepreneurs. All right, how can I better change you know, my you know, dialogue and what I'm trying to present so that it impacts my audience, right? If you care Absolutely. as a guest. And then Absolutely. suddenly things are changing and you might have to ad lib a little bit here. And yeah, I can see how that, it, and also they really appreciate it, right? I think sometimes um, people who don't want to join a prep will at least join a prep for that information, right? To, if they care, if they're a pro, they want to know, is what I'm saying going to land the way I intend it to because the people I'm talking to are hearing my message. But if I hear this, I go, okay, I got to make sure I'm speaking to my audience. Absolutely. And, and I'm happy to share. I'm a big fan of systems, simple systems. So I have um, Google Docs with like a podcast invite and I'm pretty clear. So I'm happy to share that with your listeners if that's yeah, useful to anybody. Great. Like just how I word it. It's, it's short, but I feel like people oftentimes, I used to get more friction about this, like, oh, I'm busy. I don't have time for this. But when I dialed in the language about what happens in the meet and greet and particularly about helping them understand, picking a topic and helping them like together thinking about how to present what their topic is in a way that's both really aligned with the goals that they have for being on a show, but also is going to really engage our audience. Cause when our audience gets engaged, they go out and tell their friends and our audience are some of the more dedicated, they have, they have big networks in the social, in the space yeah. that my guests want to access. And when they realize, Oh, Paul's not just being a jerk or trying to waste my time. He's trying to help me get more results then the amount of friction, not that I don't ever get friction, but the amount of friction is way less than it used to be. So I'm happy to share the um, language, but basically just try to create templates that help people understand why you're doing certain things, like if you do decide to do a meet and greet. You know, and you mentioned we're 97% overlap. I would I would say at least 70% because I heard some great stuff here that even I don't do. And one of the first things I heard before you even described the audience was the mission, the purpose, the why. And you were like, this is why I'm doing it. This is what I care about. This is, this is my why. And then people who agree with that or have the same one, they listen to it, right? And I thought, well, that's kind of like, like a high level who's listening. I wonder if he'll go in detail. And you did. And you're like, and we have two buckets. And then you even did established how you know what these buckets are. You're not just pulling this from the sky. These are people that have emailed. These are people that have contacted you. So like, I'm not just giving you hot air here. These are the kind of people that reach out. And then you got very specific. So there's two different kind of groups I could speak to. Uh, that was powerful, man. I, I That alone, I, I could see, could just really help frame your episode. Right. Find great guests and prepare them to have an extraordinary dialogue. That's what I, I that's what I was trying to help people do so, and, and and I'm a really granular entrepreneur, so I don't just talk in theories. I'll I'll share as much detail as humanly possible. I love the shift a little bit. You mentioned the counseling, right? The mental health, the community mental health, the counseling. Do you see any parallels to podcasting? Do you ever have to keep yourself from doing counseling on a, on an episode? Uh, you know and. And how do they overlap and how, how not? You know, again, I referenced that, but I didn't know that my training, matter of fact, it was really bumpy. The short version is my first career. Technically, I was licensed as a community mental health counselor, but just think about it as a social worker. I like to joke that my yeah. trajectory was from social worker to social entrepreneur. And, and full disclosure, mm. that was not a fun transition. That sucked. I had no business training whatsoever, but I knew that I couldn't, you know, being a broke social worker at the time, my kid was quite young and my marriage was falling apart partially because of 
the choices I made as a career, like it wasn't easy to support a family as a broke social worker. Right. Anyway. Um, so I just want right. to be full disclosure. It was not an easy transition to learn how to leverage those skills, but suddenly I remember the day I found myself at Google at the time. Now, now there's a, something called a search inside your self leadership Institute, where they're talking about emotional intelligence and mindfulness based stress reduction. Google's run tens of thousands of employees and the research is off the charts about the kind of results that people who are higher in the degrees of emotional intelligence in business settings, what they contribute compared to people, even really, 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 really smart people um, contribute um, through the power of their hard skills alone. It's like, if you have to choose, go for emotional intelligence every time. And that book will help you understand why. And would you say so it's, it's locked in stone like IQ or, or, or is there flexibility and muscles you can build on the it, EQ It's side? absolutely. That's why, yeah, Google's not dumb. They don't invest in training that doesn't, yeah. Right. Sorry, sucks to be you. Your emotional <laughs> intelligence is quite low. You You're know? paying for life. <laughs> see, see you later. Bye. Right? No, yeah. these are teachable skills, but most business environments don't. And especially if you go back, it's moving. We're seeing things like Harvard, you know, HBR and, and um, Stanford has a whole program about compassion. And it, it, we're seeing very significant movement in the under LinkedIn as a compassion program within LinkedIn, where they're teaching emotional intelligence and compassion skills at LinkedIn, cool. right? Um, these are not like hippie businesses. These are real, like very significant businesses that understand and looked at the data. So anyway, I just want to be transparent. It was, it was a bumpy road to get from social worker to social entrepreneur. But I can remember as it started to click, oh, this is how you leverage this skill about understanding human motivation. I got trained in something called motivational interviewing, for instance, fabulous skill set to have. And one of the fundamental skills that most of the modern coaching world is based on that they don't give credit for. I don't know why coaching, you need to give more credit to the motivational interviewing skill set. Dr. William Miller lives, uh, did a lot of his research at the University of New Mexico, which is three or four miles up the road. Um, was talking about it way before executive coaching was a thing. Um, understanding what motivates humans and how to tap into that was something I literally have graduate training in. And once I relaxed of like, but I don't know how to market. I'm not very good at bookkeeping an account. Well, you can hire a bookkeeper and I can learn how to market, but it's actually much longer build to learn how humans are wired, how to understand what people's strengths and challenges are in teams, learn about messaging in a way that can land for the kind it's empathy. I call it empathy based marketing, right? Like before yeah. you try to like kind of ram a message down somebody's throat, understanding how are they wired? What do they care about? What are their challenges? Literally I have a graduate training in that, but I, I had to get through some of my own kind of limiting beliefs that some of this was transferable. And not only was it transferable, it's actually the harder stuff to teach and it moves the needle more on the outcomes you want in business. Finally, I relaxed. But back in the day, I was so embarrassed. <laughs> oh, I'm like doing business coaching and I have a master's in counseling. And I was like waiting for somebody to say, you're a fraud, because that was what was going on in my right. head. So it, it was a process to um, work through some of that. I, I imagine. And I think even hearing that it was bumpy makes us that much more interested in the the kind of things you've learned and how, how that's transferred over because i feel like the the bumpier it is you know the more chance there is to learn even if it is the hard way there's a great book for anybody who's not getting the results you're wanting in marketing or any other part of business totally different domains sometimes it's really fun to switch up domains yeah. the book is called fit to fat to fit it's about this guy who's like he was he was an osteopath or some kind of wellness kind of health professional and a trainer. And the guy has good genes and he's ripped. Right. And he's like, I'm trying to work with my clients and like, they're just not getting great. Yes. They're I'm giving this great information, but it's like, I'm getting mediocre results. Right. And he's like, I'm missing something. And, and what he got through some help of cared mentors and trusted advisors that he was missing a bit of that empathy that we've been talking about. So what he intentionally did is I think it was six months. He, he stopped working out and he ate a horrible diet and gained like 60 or 80 pounds. 
right? Oh, I feel like I've heard of this guy. Yeah, I can't remember his name, right? But the, the book is all about his journey and the journey of putting on the weight and eating McDonald's and drinking milkshakes and donuts for breakfast. Like, all right, that, whatever. But the part that was really interesting to me that I got a lot of value out of Casey is he talks about what it was like when it was time to start to get back in shape. And he was like, I had no idea. So he was like, he had never moved in a body like this. And suddenly he'd be like, you know, he would always tell his clients, well, if, if, if intense exercise doesn't work, well, then just walk. But the way his body had changed, suddenly he was like chafing in places he didn't know a human body could chafe. And even walking <laughs> was really, really uncomfortable. It was hard. And he didn't understand that because he had great genes and, you know, he had a PhD level. I think it was, he was an osteopath or something like that. He, he had, he yeah. was come from a privileged background, had great quality food, had been athletic all his life, great genes, well, just walk. And people who, you know, didn't have some of the advantages that he had were like, what do you mean just walk? This is really hard. I'm uncomfortable. I'm sweating. I'm chafing. I don't like this. Language I have that maybe, you know, they didn't have your, what's called your central regulator. Like it wants to save calories because back in the day, that was something that was, helped us survive by not being eat more so you don't die do it now well just yeah conserve calories because calories in a modern conserve, life like yeah. calories you know i could buy there's literally a store like you know 150 yards from my house there's a bakery the best bakery in the city is like 100 yards oh, from my no. house but that's not how oh, it no. works so yeah it's really good bakery so <laughs> So, so we're designed to conserve calories, but he like, so, so, so we have things like, wait, you're burning calories. And especially if that's not something you've done, your nervous system is going to try to talk you out of it. Or like, you're going to hurt yourself, right? Like this isn't good. Okay. You already walked three minutes. That's enough. Get off. Right. He wasn't helping people understand that like walking at a slow pace for 20 minutes, if you've been a couch potato, eating donuts and McDonald's for breakfast, it's going to be a lot of friction and it won't always be like that. But he wasn't yeah. understanding the various physical, mental and emotional challenges that somebody was facing. So his outcomes, in this case, helping his clients get fit, were really mediocre. And after he had this experience, same information. It's fascinating to read. Like he didn't go and get another PhD in exercise science or like get some major upgrade in his knowledge about fitness or nutrition. But what he got is a major upgrade in empathy. And that changed everything. Yeah. The results his clients got were off the charts. Wow. Just, just having walked in their shoes, you know, can you perceive how all this training has made you a better interviewer or made you a better listener? I think part of it is being aware, like I was blessed to be on a family therapy team by with an incredible mentor. And one of the experiences, not, a, not many people have had an experience like this. It was a one-way mirror. And so as a graduate person learning how to work with families in crisis, there was the family and it, so it was an hour and a half session. It was a one-way mirror. And the family knew this. They agreed and they were excited about it. And the therapist usually, at least at the beginning, my, my mentor, um, her, her name is Pat. And then two or three of us students, she would be doing the session. We'd be in a one-way mirror. And then about 40 minutes into an hour and a half session, we'd switch. And the family would come behind the one-way mirror. The interns would come and sit in the circle. And, and the therapist and the uh, family would watch the interns and us have a conversation. Wow, I really noticed dad got really quiet, kind of dropped out of the conversation when, you know, uh, oldest kid said uh, X, right? Or like yeah. youngest kid said Y and the therapist, like, like it seemed like the therapist, might, if I was in the shoes, I'd be curious what the younger kid said. And then eventually we got to be the person conducting the session with the family and the other team would come in on our session to just see different viewpoints. So like you and I are having this conversation here and I can only see your face right now, but I can almost like feel the audience listening in and there's training. 
I earned every one of these gray hairs, Casey. But the being aware of multiple perspectives at the same time definitely helps me as yeah. a podcaster because it's not just I can't just get lost in the conversation that you and I are having or me and my guests are having and provide all the value I want to. I want to be here with you, but also aware that listeners and who you care about listeners and the impact you want to have in your marketing and your B2B marketing that you're listening for tips and strategies. It's like sitting in the room with us, just like it was back in the day when I was behind a one-way mirror, right? And then got to be in front, like, Here's the conversation now, but there's other people who are really paying attention, even if they're quiet right now. They're not saying words into the room, but their needs, their desires, their passions, their challenges are all in the room right when you and I are having this conversation. Absolutely translates. Right. What did you call that kind of therapy when you had the mirror and the people in the room? Uh, it, it, it's a one way mirror is the actual, um, but, but it was just, fa I was on a family therapy tr a team. It was a training team in my internship site at a community mental health clinic. This was in Massachusetts way back in the day. You know, what it reminded me of, I I've definitely heard some, some talk around, you know, I don't know if you, you know, Chris Voss and then negotiator, the FBI yes. negotiator, the, yeah. um, I've definitely heard that on negotiation teams, you never just have one person. You've got one person talking and you've got someone else, you know, listening for certain things and another person's just recording. They're just writing things right. down. And, you know. and that way it frees you up not to have to, you know, remember certain things. But I, I can totally see the value of, you know, you and I are chatting and then, and then what happens? Like you mentioned something very interesting that, that maybe I didn't get a chance to talk to or I didn't even catch. And to have them come in and wouldn't that be an interesting podcast to have <laughs> awesome. like two yeah. hosts, right? right. Where now, you and all, I are right, chatting. Come on, all you people, all you people behind the one way mirror. Now you come yeah. and talk about what Casey and I have been talking about, right? Totally. That'd be fun. Ask yeah. that question. They, they, they wish they could have asked or like, I, I heard things change a little bit when this happened. You know, I totally. want to ask you more about that, you know, and then you switch totally. and it's like you tag team. Fascinating. That'd be fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah. Oh, good stuff. Well, you know, I could talk to you all day, but I'd love to just ask you this quick question. Podcasting is amazing, but dot, dot, dot. What's your biggest challenge still with podcasting? Honestly, not much. <laughs> it wasn't always true. Kids, nice. But these days I have workflows. I know it's hard. I mean, I still am looking to scale the show. So, you know, finding scale given some of the choices I've made. I don't do video. It's audio only. I really have conversations with people who are pushing the edges. And just by definition, if you think of a bell curve on any topic, I'm, I'm going for a slice. So there's like a tension, I mean, not a challenge, but just a tension based on the choice of being like far out on the impact scale. There's a bell curve, yeah. the numbers of folks. It, it, and that's fine for me revenue wise, but there is a desire to have more positive impact. And so there's a tension between, I don't yeah. want to like back off of like the people who are pushing the boundaries of what's possible with impact as much as possible. And if I backed off and made it a more middle of the road focus on impact, it would probably appear to a, appeal to a wider audience, but I don't want to stop interviewing some of the most, like when I say impact business owner, like they're pushing the, so th there's a, it's more of a tension than a challenge. Um, Understand, that, but that's what comes to mind. Uh, the the fun guests or the impactful guests, the, the business sense guests, the ones that, yeah, it, it all is is. You can have a whole other show on that. You come back, we just <laughs> we just riff off that for. But final question to you: We chat again fifty episodes from now. What do you want your show to look like? You know, one of the things I've been thinking about, and um, can't say a lot yet, but it, we're in conversation. I want to be synced up with other impact podcasters. So certainly there's a podcast network conversation going on. Um, there's a lot of siloing, not just in the impact space, but certainly in the impact space. So I want it to be not just about me and my podcast and this guest. I want to help find ways to other people understand the power of podcasting and kind of put it in the, the, the a mentor of mine used the um, metaphor of a dog sled, right? If you get 
all the dogs pulling in the same direction with a good kind of like team spirit, there's nothing that can move you through extreme circumstances like a dog sled. And, and so I feel mm. a little rogue partly because like I just got started so early and partially because I uh, both through my training that I did learn eventually how to leverage, but also because I've um, worked for a conference in Silicon Valley and I've been to Google and I've talked to the people who built Twitter and, you know, like I, I, I've been really blessed to have some very robust mentoring and be part of conversations early. Um, I, I'm a, I'm a little bit more of a lone wolf than I want to be. I, did, I have a great network, but I want the podcast mm. to plug into something that's larger than one podcast. That's a real focus of mine. And there's a bunch of conversations about what that might look like but it hasn't all landed yet. So I want to be able to say in 50 episodes, Casey, it landed. We landed that plane and it's really fun to be pulling in the dog sled with a bunch of other impact crazies. Oh, I love that. The impact sled to impact. <laughs> oh man. And you have like a fake fur coat on. You're like, we're doing it. We're doing it guys. Oh, Let's yeah, go. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so you'll either see me in burning man or something with a sled in the middle of the <laughs> desert, or I'll be a, somewhere in the wilds of Maine with a dog sled or something. I don't know. Heck yeah. Well, Maine is right next to me. So let's, let's uh, make that a, on the, on yeah. the list for sure. Dude, this has been absolutely fantastic. Where can people connect with you, reach out to you, all those things? Yeah. So socials, I'm most active on LinkedIn. I'm kind of on all the platforms, but I'm not really on all the platforms. Like LinkedIn is really where I'm, if you send me a message, I'll answer you. You can send me a message on Instagram, but you'll probably never hear from me. <laughs> Just <laughs> not my thing. Um, and right. uh, two websites, if you want to listen to the podcast, awarepreneurs.com, and we're on all the platforms, but there is a podcast, uh, a site just for the podcast. And for my coaching and consulting, it's my name, paulzelizer.com. Beautiful. Amazing. Thank you so much, Paul. Like, fantastic conversation. You know, sometimes you interview people and you have a conversation you're like, oh, it was good. You know, we learned a lot. But then there's other times you're like, I'm going to stay in touch with this guy. And for sure, we're going to go hiking. Uh, oh, I'd so love thank to do you so that. much for coming on here. Thanks so much for having me, Casey. I really appreciate it. And for those listening, if you learned something, and I freaking know you did because I literally have two pages of notes over here front and back. Then share this episode with one person, nine people, 3,000 people with that. Paul, thanks again, man. Thanks so much, Casey. All right, everyone, this has been another crazy episode of Creating the Greatest Show. We will see you all next time. And next time doesn't have to be next week. Life's too short, and we have way too much to talk about. Find show notes full of takeaways, lessons, and links at creatingthegreatestshow.com. For more information on launching your own podcast or working with us to produce your existing show, come on down to the big tent at ringmaster.com. Until then, friends. Whatever you do, do it with all your might. Work at it, if necessary, early and late, in season and out of season, not leaving a stone unturned and never deferring for a single hour. That which can be done just as well now. P.T. Barnum. <laughs>